all the, in terms of understanding the biology, all the models that we used were models that drew correlations to human effects. And by correlation, what I mean is, suppose we used, we used a tissue called the rat fundus, which is a little piece of muscle from the rat's stomach. And we would suspend that in a little a bath of buffer and add drugs to it, and that tissue would contract. And what we knew was that the drugs that were the most potent psychedelics in humans were also the most potent in producing a contraction in that tissue. And conversely, drugs that were weak, weakly active in humans were weak in that tissue. So it was a correlation, and we could uh, actually draw a line that, that correlated the human potency with the ability, for example, to contract that tissue. So everything we did involved correlations between what we knew about the human potency and what was going on in the model. So we started with these smooth muscle tissues, we looked at uh, a mouse ear scratch assay where the mouse lifts his paw up and kind of scratches behind his ear. Um, I worked with cats for a while because cats were known when you gave them psychedelics to um, shake their paws if they had a drop of water on it and just kind of stare out in space as if they were hallucinating. We used cats for a while but they were expensive and, and fairly unreliable. We eventually in the mid 80s uh, settled on an assay called drug discrimination. And that's an assay in rats that actually is probably the best rat model for the state uh, of, any, of any model, and maybe even better than, than any model, period. And we essentially have a chamber with two levers inside, and we train the rat uh, such that when we give the rat a placebo injection, and the rat presses, for example, the left lever, uh, he gets a, a rat pellet, which is actually a small sucrose pellet. A rat, we call them rat candies. And then we give the rat LSD or some other psychoactive drug, and then we turn on the right lever in this, in this case. So he presses the right lever, and he gets a food pellet. And so we train that rat over a period of two to three months, giving placebo on one day and just only activating the left lever, giving LSD, for example, on alternate days and only activating the right lever. And after about two to three months, the rat learns that task very reliably, 99%. So on any given day, if we put the rat in that chamber, give that rat placebo or saline saltwater injection, the rat will reliably press on the left lever. If we give the rat LSD, the rat will press on the right lever. And then once the rats are trained, we take the new compounds we've made and administer them to the rat in different doses. So if the rat responds on the lever that was associated with the placebo, then he's, the rat is in essence saying, I don't think you gave me LSD. And if the rat responds on the lever that was associated with the LSD treatment, the rat is saying, I think you gave me LSD. And that's really about the best assay we have. It's simply the rat says, I think you gave me the psychedelic training drug, or I don't think you gave it to me. And of course, it's a, it's a pale reflection of what you'd really like to see with clinical studies, because obviously uh, the substances we make probably have very different psychoactive properties in humans. And all the rat can say is, I think you gave me a psychedelic, or I don't think you gave me a psychedelic. And that's really the limit of what we've been able to do with the, the behavioral models. There is a good correlation in drug discrimination. The potency in these trained rats to uh, select the, for example, LSD-associated lever is highly correlated with the human potency, what we know of the human potency. Again, uh, drugs that are the most potent in producing that LSD-like effect in rats are also the most potent LSD-like drugs in humans.